<clears throat> so, and thank you all for uh, tuning in. Um, hope this is interesting. This is uh, I'm going to be presenting on a project that we in Arizona have had going for we're in our 16th year now. Um, it's something that <clears throat> started out as a fairly small and local thing and has uh, kind of taken off and really grown. Um, so as Eric said, I'm going to aim for about a half hour, so I'm hoping we'll have plenty of time for questions. There's you know, no end of technical details, but it's really kind of a simple concept. Um, all right, so just to orient you, um, here's a map of Arizona. The San Pedro River watershed spans the boundary between Arizona and the state of Sonora in Mexico. And we have work on this project on both sides of that international border and throughout the San Pedro River watershed. Um, the, there are many people, many organizations involved in this work, um, both Governmental, um, nonprofit, as well as you know, a, a mining company, BHP Billiton. So it's gotten you know broad interest and buy-in. The the project started in 1999, um, <clears throat> working to work between the Nature Conservancy and the Bureau of Land Management in the San Pedro River National Conservation Area. That's it's an area that stretches about 50 miles from the international border with Mexico north. Um, just the San Pedro River runs south to north. Um, anyway, so th you'll see on this graph, the first couple of years we covered 50 miles, that being that reach in what we often refer to as Sprinca, San Pedro River, right? San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. And we have continued to work that stretch consistently through all the years. But then we added um, portions in Mexico and then through the middle and, and downstream end of the main stem. And then more recently, we started adding tributaries just to really understand the water resources in this watershed. So we're really trying to answer one basic question. Where does the surface water persist during the driest time of year? And for us, identifying the driest time of year is pretty easy. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a dry summer season that stretches April through June. And then somewhere around the beginning of July, we have uh, summer rains that start. So late June, is predictably hot, dry, and if the water is going to shrink back, that is the lowest point. Um, and I should mention that the San Pedro is a river that it's supported by groundwater. It's groundwater dominated. Um, there are clearly ephemeral reaches that dry up every year. Um, there are intermittent re reaches. There are perennial reaches. But you know, what we've learned, one of the things we've learned from this project is that what is perennial is kind of a fuzzy uh, definition. You know, we have really truly perennial, and we have sort of mostly perennial, and we have, you know, it's perennial in a good year. So what does that make it? I don't know. Um, I guess the the term that I like is interrupted perennial because we have really truly, you know, perennial reaches that are in separated by portions that go dry every year or most years or just some years. So to measure these, to monitor these, um, what we do is go out with GPS units, have people on the ground with GPS units recording the beginning and ending point of the wet reaches on a given day, uh, maybe a couple of days, 
at the driest time of year. Um, so many of those people just walk the river, which is a whole lot of fun. Um, but we are multimodal. Some people ride horses. Um, we've had portions of it done on kayak. Uh, we've had people on uh, ATVs. We've had people in pickup trucks on you know long, really dry reaches. The critical point is that we're, we have people on the ground covering the whole reach of the river so that we can say on that day what was wet and what was dry. Um, so in that sense, it is uh, true, you know, science data collection um, from a whole lot of people. Um, last year we had almost 130 people out there within about a five-day window. So it's, it's kind of a big project, but the, the basic data collection is pretty simple. Um, the one complication is that um, we try to limit what we call a wet reach to things that are 30 feet long or longer um, so that basically we're not out there um, monitoring tiny puddles. You know, the, the initial impetus of this was the, the limitations of the GPS units themselves and selective availability with um, GPS technology. Um, with better GPS units, that technological constraint is less of a factor, but I still think it's useful to maintain that um, sort of minimum mapping unit just so that, as I said, we're not mapping tiny puddles or tiny breaks in what is otherwise continuous flow. Um, <clears throat> we have associated with the GPS data, um, we have paper data forms that people fill out in the field as they're collecting data, both as a backup for the digital files, but more importantly, to allow us on the back end to understand what those points mean. So, you know, people are just collecting, they're recording in their GPS units points. And after the fact, all those points look the same, whether it's start of a wet reach, stop of a wet reach, or a random error that they hit the, the mark button. Um, so the data form is where we get sort of the, the meaning of the points. Um, then those uh, the digital files downloaded from the GPS units come in and the data forms and it becomes a GIS exercise those points to lines. Um, so here is just an example of a screenshot from uh, ArcMap. That's you know standard GIS uh, software <clears throat> where you can see we have our line representing the course of the river and we have four points on there that were start and stop points. Um, the the line of the river is never precisely where the line on the map runs. Um, I, I don't think it really can be unless you're creating a new river line every year because rivers move around. So there is, you know, a little bit of slop in the system, but we've found over the years that it, it's it's pretty consistent. Um, you know. We can go back and compare year to year, and some of those dry breaks in otherwise, you know, longer continuous wet reaches are very accurately mapped, despite this um, little bit of uh, inherent error in the mapping. Um, so the, the the GIS work is 
the, the tedious part of it. It's not nearly as much fun as going out there walking along the river. Um, but it's not tremendously complicated. And you know, if somebody wants to go into a project like this, I can walk them through the, 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 the nuts and bolts of, of actually setting that up. Um, <clears throat> now, we're using um, a, a process called linear referencing within GIS. And this is something that, you know, if you or someone doing the GIS work of this is, is attacking it, it's a fairly common um, sort of realm of GIS. It's used for um, a largely uh, utilities. So if you have, you know, a sewer infrastructure or a roadway infrastructure, um, you don't want to be creating a new line every time you add uh, point data associated with that line. Um, so this is a way of just using one consistent set of line work and then associating point data with that. So what you see here is just a, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, the first column name is just the name of the particular stream that we're attributing information to. The from measure, F maze, and to measure, T maze, are just uh, that line is calibrated, typically in meters from one end, um, with distance. So those points that I showed on the previous slide um, align with some distance from the end. And that allows you to come up with just a simple table that shows the start and the stop points for every wet reach. And then it, it's pretty simple to manipulate, summarize, just play with this um, table in Excel to come up with you know, statistics about um, what's, what the results are. So once we've um, taken all the points from the survey, turned it into uh, mapped lines, then we can create pretty display maps. So this is last year's um, last year's results. Red shows places that were surveyed and found to be dry. Blue is places that were wet. Um, so uh, we're covering most of the main stem of the San Pedro River. These days, um, we're surveying about 144 miles of main stem, and last year, 165 miles of tributaries. Um, this sort of, you know, mapping has been really useful as a communications tool, just to talk about the status of the river. Um, <clears throat> and you know, we we also do um, sort of zoomed-in versions for various portions of the watershed. This shows you that San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area and, and what was wet and dry in that last year. Um, comparing uh, results year to year has been a, it was an ongoing challenge for a while. So this is what we were doing for the first, I don't know, 10 years of just sort of displaying them you know, just sort of as a squiggly line side by side. And that got old after a while, you know. It's kind of hard to make much sense out of this. So um, this is what we've gone to now, where the map is on the left. And in this case, it's just showing the wetted reaches, not the dry reaches. Um, and then to the right of that, if you imagine taking that squiggly line and stretching it out straight, um, this is how the pattern of wet and dry reaches appears over time. And as I mentioned earlier, you can see there are places, uh, let's see if I can 
there are places like here where we have a pretty consistent break in what is otherwise a persistently wet reach. That gives us information about where to look and see, you know, what's going on there. Um, uh, with, as I mentioned, the um, knowing the, the lengths of those wetted reaches allows us to summarize and over time we've accumulated a large enough sample size we can get statistically significant uh, trend out of that and that's what you see on this right hand set of uh, graphs where um, in this uh, segment one closest to the international border it appears we have a downward trend um, there's less wetted length over time the reach just north of that seems to be on an upward trend. Um, we've got some some theories about why that is, but um, just as a monitoring tool, this is a pretty useful um, uh, te technique. So, in this sense, um, the wet-dry mapping really complements the uh, stream gauge data. So in the case of stream gauges, um, you have continuous uh, measurements through time at a fixed location. In the case of our wet-dry mapping, we have uh, a point-in-time measurement across a continuous reach of the river. So it, it, it tells you different things about what's going on with the flow. Um, this is the um, what's happened with flow across that 50-mile reach of the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. Um, what you might guess from looking at this is that not much is changing, um, which is a fairly different story from this previous slide, which is breaking that 50-mile reach into 10 smaller segments. So it's it's interesting just you know to break it up spatially and look at the patterns across uh, the length of the river. Um, this graph is just to show you the um, the correlation that can be done between wet-dry mapping and stream gauge data. So this is the daily, the mean daily flow at one gauge within that San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. That's on the x-axis compared to the the what was total mapped wet for um, the length of the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. And there's there's a very clear correlation, um, no surprise. But um, as I said, the, you know, the gauge data tells you something different from the wet-dry data. And then uh, one other thing that we've gotten out of this project is just getting people's feet wet, getting them in the stream to see what's going on and make a personal connection with the river. When this project started in 1999, um, there was a fair amount of debate in the local community about the current status of the river. Some people thought it was doing just fine. It was doing great. There was lots of water out there. Some people thought it was basically dead and they'd given up on it. Um, neither of those were completely accurate. Um, you know, there's elements of truth in both of those cases. I mean, there's certainly issues here. But getting folks out there walking the river together to see it um, really uh, changed the discussions about conditions in the river. So um, just that 
that sort of you know shared understanding has been really useful. Now, I just want to touch on um, a couple of other places that have used this same approach. Um, these are all in Arizona, so our national parks near Tucson, um, Agua Fria National Monument, that's a BLM monument up in central Arizona, uh, La Cienegas National Conservation Area, um, and Cienega Creek Natural Preserve, which is a county preserve. Um, uh, this is that county preserve, and I just wanted to show you, you know, a different approach to displaying the data that the county has done. Pretty similar to, to what we're using. Um, and then this is something that, you know, the, where the National Park Service, they're using wet, dry data at Saguaro National Park for a fairly short reach of what's called Rincon Creek. Um, it's only like two and a half, three miles, but that's Park Service land that's adjacent to a lot of private land where there is um, significant groundwater pumping. Now, what they're showing in this graph is a comparison between their wet dry data and depth to groundwater. And in this case, they're actually going out and doing wet dry surveys uh, twice a month. So every couple of weeks, they walk that um, short reach of the river. And so the blue is depth to groundwater. Um, so that's the blue line through there, and that's that's just in feet of elevation. The red is the percent of that short reach they're surveying that was found to be wet in a given survey. And um, it's pretty interesting to show that to see that um, you know there's a threshold there in where when the depth to water gets below some point, basically they start losing and then completely lose the surface expression of the water. Um, not surprising, you know, it's what you would expect in a groundwater driven system, but being able to clearly demonstrate and say, you know, where is that threshold gives them some, uh, some place to start in conversations with people, you know, managing the wells in the vicinity. So uh, with that, I think I will stop, and uh, I'd be really interested in um, you know, your questions and how you see this might be useful in other places. Thank you, Dale. At this time, you can ask your questions by unmuting your phone with star six, and you can also send your questions in via the chat. Yeah, th thanks for adding that project uh, you just went over, Dale, uh, that twice monthly monitoring there. That, that was really interesting. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I would love to be able to do that on the San Pedro, but uh, my goodness, uh, managing 130 people across, you know, 300 miles has been, it's enough of a challenge on an annual basis. I can't imagine doing it every other week. Okay, Bill, we have a uh, question that was texted in. How do you normalize or account for managed water activities such as diversions? Okay, um, in our systems, we don't have any um, active diversions, so that that makes life easy. Um, but because you you know, a diversion is at a fixed location. Um, I suspect that you could um, treat the data differently for some distance downstream of that point. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? And you can ask your questions by unmuting your phone with star six. You can also send them in via text. Uh, we have a chat question again. Uh, how much training is required for the volunteers? 
Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that because <clears throat> I should have covered it. Um, we typically have a one to two hour training session every year for all the volunteers. Um, <clears throat> so the the longest running, running one there at uh, the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area is typically a barbecue with beer um, on the the day before the I'm sorry the week before the the uh, event. Um, so we just go over the basic uh, methodologies, just refresh people, and um, you know if there are any new volunteers, give them that, and then we have them walk through you know that that 30 foot rule just have sort of a little measured out uh, course to try it out so they get a sense of, you know, how many paces it takes to be 30 feet. Um, it's pretty simple. We've really stressed keeping the protocol simple so that there are limited opportunities for, for error in that. Um, but we do insist that people get that little bit of training just to make the data collection consistent. We have a follow-up question on that. Uh, what kind of commitment do you ask of the volunteers and how many days do they work? Um, it's just the, the training event and then the, the one day, it was really a half day of um, walking their reach of the river. So uh, we as coordinators um, figure out, the, you know, what makes a, a reasonable reach for one survey team to cover. And that's typically, I don't know, three miles or so. Um, and then assign people to those reaches. So we ask for a commitment to, you know, show up and do the reach that they are assigned. Um, but once they do that and provide the data, then they're done. Okay. Uh, another question coming through. Uh, it's regarding the GPS units. Are they all the same? If not, how do you account for the uh, different accuracy of the various instruments? Uh, the units are not all the same. Um, and uh, the units do provide an error estimate. I mean, when you record a, a waypoint, um, it records with that a, uh, an error estimate, and we have a space on the data form for that error estimate. So uh, we can use that to, um, to normalize or, or you know, identify what the error is. But typically, it's less than our 30-foot sort of minimum mapping unit. Now, uh, are your programs supplying the GPS units, or are volunteers bringing theirs as well? We have tried to provide the GPS units for this, um, and so uh, over the you know the last 15 years, we've accumulated a fair number of, of units. Um, but what we're finding is now pretty much everybody who's a hardcore hiker has a GPS unit. Um, what they may not have is the, the ability, familiarity with how to download that and share a digital file out of it. So having some consistency in those units makes it simpler for us to, you know, have a, a, a fixed place where, you know, we have somebody with a laptop with the cables to download the units right there that day so we get the data. That's great. Uh, another question is how is the program funded? Um, for a number of years, it was just um, out of pocket, you know, out of our general operating funds for Nature Conservancy and BLM. Um, in the last uh, 
handful of years, we've gotten some funding from the Walton Family Foundation as part of a, a larger grant on the San Pedro. But um, the I do know that the the work on um, La Cienegas National Conservation Area that's just been you know out of the general operating budgets because most of the work is done by volunteers. The 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 real the primary overhead is coordination in advance and then the GIS work on the back end. Yeah, generally, how much time does it take to uh, do the analysis, the GIS work, after a, a mapping project? It depends on how big the project is. Um, right. So, you know, for for the San Pedro, you know, the whole watershed generating those maps, it's it's probably a couple of weeks of consistent work, although it's typically spread out over several months because there's no no one person for whom that's the, their sole job. Thank you. We have a few more questions coming in with chat. Uh, have you considered the use of uh, weather balloons or kite aerial mapping? Uh, we did discuss aerial mapping early on. Um, and ran into, and actually there there was a a, a test effort um, where I believe it was BLM actually had somebody up in an airplane on or around the same day as the wet dry mapping, and what they found was that for the really truly dry reaches it was easy, but for the really truly perennial reaches with a, a cottonwood uh, tree canopy, they couldn't see where the water was. So uh, that becomes just a, a physical constraint. Um, so uh, I suppose you know if you had your own your own little drone that could fly under the the tree canopy, you might be able to do something like that. But what you wouldn't get out of it is that. Um, that individual connection to the water, to the stream. Right. That's a great outcome. Uh, another question coming in, it's uh, on the Saguaro project, where was the groundwater well or wells in relation to the creek, and how was the location for the well selected? Uh, is there more than one groundwater well? So. Yeah, so um, for for that graph, that's just data out of one well that's midway along the, the reach that, that was surveyed by the wet-dry mapping. Um, I know the National Park Service has four or five wells that they control along that, that reach. Um, <clears throat> how they chose that particular one to display, I don't know. Um, and you know, I, I think that's something where, if if you really wanted to do a serious comparison of uh, depth to water and uh, length of surface flow, um, you would probably want multiple wells spread out along the length of the stream. You know, it kind of depends on the question you're trying to answer. Uh, another one sent in uh, is survey complicated by multiple red channels. So if you have a braided stream, how are you handling that? Uh, good question from somebody who has walked a braided channel, it sounds like. Um, yeah, so um, in the interest of keeping this uh, relatively simple, uh, where we came down on it was to essentially map length. Um, so if there are parallel channels that are wetted, it just counts as wet. Um, if there's one channel that's wetted, that counts as wet. Um, if it's standing water or flowing water, that still counts as wet. Uh, damp soil does not count 
So we are just uh, measuring the beginning and the ending point, um, the, the farthest beginning and ending point of any continuous uh, wetted length. So if there's you know redundant channels, um, basically we, we ignore that redundancy. Um, if one of those goes dry but another one is wet, then we count that as continuous. Um, it's it's kind of simplistic, but I think in looking at a, a system wide assessment, it, it it still it has some validity. Thank you. Uh, another question coming in is regarding uh, the maps that you have available, and the question is uh, the GIS data. Is that also available online? Hmm. Yeah, uh, and the answer is no. Um, and much as that pains me as somebody who, who does GIS work and always looking for more data, um, Something that, um, that we've an, a, another complication that we've run into is that um, we're trying to look at the whole river, and only parts of that are federally owned. A lot of it is privately owned. So to get onto those private lands, every year we ask permission from the landowners. To go out and do that mapping. Um, now, uh, as part of getting that permission, one of the things that we assure people is that we will not release the data, the raw data, out of that survey, um, and we will will not release you know, fine scale maps that can identify their personal property. You know, at some level you can tell kind of where somebody's property is from a course scale map, but um, that's been sort of a, a necessary part of um, getting that continued landowner approval and participation. We do share the data for those uh, BLM managed reaches, so that 50-mile that stretch of the National Conservation Area. Yeah, we share that with, with researchers who, who want to, you know, look at other questions. It's such a uh, robust tool that's easy to implement. I really hope to see groups here in California and elsewhere implement uh, a wet-dry program. So it's something that you're interested in, uh, send me an uh, email. I'd be glad to chat with you about partnering and uh, working with citizen monitors. Yeah, and, and I would say the same. Um, so my email is there on the screen. And, um, you know, at its, at its root, it's a pretty simple method um, to answer a pretty simple question. But, you know, People could take it some interesting places, I suspect, um, and I'd be happy to, to talk somebody through just setting it up. 